Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome back to Reconnected. I'm here with Terry East, who, uh, you know, as the famous man in the chat, Flickering Waves. Terry, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Uh, really been looking forward to this. It's been a long time coming. I'm glad that we can finally make it work. Uh, we are here primarily with Terry this week because Terry and I both love music. It is something that we have talked about countless times. Uh, have, there's so much about music that we, uh, just the discord, we, we've all seemed to sort of come together on certain random genres and go deep on them some days. And uh, obviously film scores for us is a huge, huge part of that. So we're going to be talking about that tonight because it's record store day this weekend and I don't have any plans, but uh, I have a feeling you're probably already counting down the hours. Yes, um, I managed to get a, a good spot in line for uh, Saturday because the way that uh, Park Ave does it, they do a, a raffle ahead of time. Uh, that's nice. kind of something that happened at the with uh, 2020 uh, unfolding. And so I have to be over there uh, bright and early uh, Saturday morning. Uh, but nice thing about it is... Uh, we'll have a pretty good uh, uh, access to uh, what they're going to have in stock, which typically with them is pretty much everything. Good. Yeah. You should be guaranteed some of the bigger titles, which uh, a lot of these, they will sell out no joke within five or eight minutes on some of them. Yeah. There's definitely uh, one that um, I'll talk about it more when we get to the list, but uh, something that uh, was a previous record store day uh, item that I did miss out on because that particular, uh, uh, I think it was when they were doing the drops instead of just the big April, yeah. um, I just didn't do as well and missed out. So yeah, some of them can disappear very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, in the chat, we got Josephine. Josephine says, happy almost Earth Day and in honor of Earth Day. What are some of your favorite movies that depict the beauty of nature? Uh, my my go-to for this is the BBC documentaries. They are a gift to cinema. Every single one that they've ever put out. Uh, Sibner is here. What's going on? Uh, let's see. Brian's here live this week. What's going on, Brian? Happy uh, late birthday to Brian. It was his birthday this week. Mitchell, what's going on? Uh, Sibner went and saw Renfield and how to blow up a pipeline. I've heard incredible things about how to blow up a pipeline. Same, Honestly, same and Renfield, but how to blow up a pipeline is supposed to be amazing. Spaghetti, what's going Ooh. on? Kira is here watching from Australia. Oh, here's Tony, both of them coming in from Australia. What's up? Uh, let's see. What are your thoughts on Blu-rays 4Ks having a record store day type of event? Would that be enticing or make up a lot of FOMO and eBay flipping? I'll let you take that first one. Um, it would be an interesting idea. I just, I, I think the the sad reality of it is, at least with Record Store Day started, there were enough stores around the country to where that could be something where, you know, you might have to drive. And, you know, even for when I first started going, you know, it, would be an hour drive now there are places that are actually that have since opened up that take part in it that are that are closer so um it has helped bring that back and you know that's really cool but unfortunately the way um the physical when it comes to blu-rays and 4ks there's just not enough stores unfortunately i mean I, they do some i think we all can agree they do some pretty cool exclusives uh, with stores throughout the year anyways. And I would say that's probably the best we could hope for unless, uh, you know, we have a, you know, real resurgence. Yeah. I, the only other way, like if you did it online where there was only, you know, a 500 of a certain title, maybe, but honestly, I don't see how that would be advantageous for the companies anyways, because a lot of the pressings on these, they have to do at least a thousand for everything. Otherwise, the, the the printers just simply won't do it. Right. So I yeah, that's it's tough. Like I don't know, and and that's I'm kind of against that whole idea by nature, anyways, of making something super limited and basically making somebody feel like they have to purchase something at a certain time to get it. I'd rather just everybody have access to it. 
yeah, it definitely would be nice. And the thing is, admittedly, like the things that I'm most looking for this year, if I'm being honest, like I've already got one of the things on CD. And it was actually hilarious because I sat there, purchased it thinking, oh, there's no way they're going to turn this <laughs> into a record store day release. And literally the next one that came around, nice. it's on the list. So what's going on, Antoine? Uh, Joe Jack's here and shouts out Microcosm. And then uh, Spaghetti, I love this comment. Randomly bought a record today, not knowing Record Store Day was coming up or that Terry was going to be here. Must be channeling some Terry energy. <laughs> Eric's here. Hello, Christopher. Hello. Hope the business is going well in Massachusetts. Everybody go check out Legends in Granby, Massachusetts. I will shout that out every time I see your name, Chris. Uh, Sulaco88, hello. Do you buy many Region B Blu-rays? You're, you're region free, aren't you, Terry? Yes. Smart, smart man. Um, I don't know about you. I, I do. I get a lot of Region B Blu-rays. Yeah, it, it's been a pretty good mix lately. I know the last big uh, drop that I got from uh, Grindhouse is actually, now, now I think about it, let's see. Yeah, because there's um, three of the second site titles, uh, Dinner in America, which I believe... That's technically region, at least on the packaging says region yep. B. And um, same thing with on the it, over the edge. Uh, that was a recent pick. Uh, well, not as recent, but so Look yeah. I'm, shining through with that music. Both of those movies are dedicated to music. Love that. Yeah, I think that's something that, like, even thinking about my letterbox is like the top four that I've had on there, which. You know, people that know me know that one of those is specifically my my top movie, and that'll probably never n never leave the the four. But uh, thinking about those four, it's like all of them, whether it's a soundtrack or a score, they're just uh, they they weigh pretty heavy into why I like those those movies. That makes sense. Completely does. Uh, so yeah, we we both buy quite a few. If uh, yeah, if if I took a snapshot of all recent things, like. Most of the imprint stuff are labeled region B, even though they're 99% of the time region free. I've probably got one or two in this box that are region B. Yeah, I, I get a lot of them. Uh, Brian is watching Bloody Muscle Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder from Hell. Nice choice. Uh, let's see. Simner says his record store sells Blu-rays and 4Ks. Nice. Yeah, the one that um, Park Ave that I typically go to the most they have a small section the only thing that's disheartening about that is you know they they're full retail so it's like yep. uh, they're even more expensive than say like a grindhouse or an orbit yeah so. yeah and i don't even remember the last time i saw a blu-ray or a, a movie at all in a record store that i've been in in god probably five years at least uh, John's at work tonight. Best of luck, John. All that is, man, Brian is here on time and Spaghetti is too. That's wild. Uh, Chris in Granby, Massachusetts, he, he needs people to come in and trade in some boutique Blu-rays and 4Ks, so stop in. Uh, Mitchell watches Zoo Warriors of the Magic Mountain. Nice. that Probably that new Shout release. Uh, recommended for those that like Big Trouble in Little China that we talked about a lot last night. Tony just watched Bo's Afraid, and I'm insanely jealous. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping to see Evil Dead Rise this weekend, but Bo's Afraid is just so long. It's so hard to dedicate that much time to it. Yeah, I'm definitely, I think there's a, I think maybe it's in Ohio. There, there's some drive-in out there this weekend that's going to be doing uh, Evil Dead Rise and the original as a nice. double feature this weekend. So oh, I'm very, very envious of them. Uh, Tony says so far all imprints have been region free. That is pretty dang sweet. I I wonder how Australia gets away with it. It seems like them uh, imprint and umbrella they they never seem to get anything requiring them in their contracts to to region lock their titles. Pretty pretty advantageous. Uh, let's see. Reggie says <laughs> that is Chester, I believe, and he changed his name. Finally, he said he was going to. Uh, I'm not region free. Can you recommend an affordable region free player and where to find it? Um, well, if you're going to go region free, I personally recommend 220 Electronics, and I do have a video on it on the channel. It's uh, it, it is a wide arena out there, but also 
it's it, it can be tough to to kind of wade through so make sure you get in the right one something that you're comfortable with something that will help future proof you what uh what region free player are you on do you remember offhand uh let's see it's a sony uh the something x700 i think nice. the one that i ended up with yeah very it was nice. one of those things that I, I still have the Oppo Blu-ray player that, uh, but it was just time to go go to 4K because I was just like I don't know when right. I, I had an opportunity to to make that purchase and I wasn't sure when it was going to happen again. So that makes sense. Uh, Bren is here watching that new Fright Night release from last year. It is a ridiculously good release, that's for sure. Um. Let's see, you got any pickups or recent watches you want to talk about before we do announcements? Sure. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, there's a friend of mine, uh, Joel, who hopefully, probably not watching tonight, but I'm pretty sure he'll check this out at some point. And uh, he recently took part of his uh, garage and turned it into a, an old style video store. Nice. And um, has posters and banners and then he's got one one section devoted to vhs and has some dvds and blu-rays in one corner and then in one lonely little box he has um a selection of laser disc and he was just sitting Ooh. there giving me the tour today oh well, not today this would have been last friday and he was like you're a fred olin ray fan right and i was like yeah yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> so he went ahead and uh, he found this online with a few other titles, <laughs> and he went ahead and uh, gave that to me. So, yeah, so, and the funny thing is, um, never, um, never had a laser disc player, never picked up a laser disc. So, this is now I can say I actually have all these years after the format went dead. Uh, I, I have a laser disc. Very nice. And uh, would have turned out. He he reminded me. Uh, Fred Olin Ray was actually over at Tampa Bay Screams uh, this past weekend, and uh, he was like, "You go over there and get it autographed." And I was like, eh. "That I I would have loved to have seen his reaction to that." Yeah, maybe next year. He he he's a pretty regular. Uh, uh, guest at that well convention. I believe, doesn't he live in florida yes yes he does actually I um earlier in the year um i i'm blinking now on what his relation was to the person but there's um i got a couple books about spook shows and he actually knows one of the one of them is like the story of the guy who did all these spook shows from back in the day and he had a limited number of copies of them, and I picked up both of those books direct from from uh, Phil and Ray. So, um, yeah, I've been looking forward to checking those out because ever since uh, something weird did their uh, spook show spectacular uh, vinyl release, uh, I definitely piqued my interest in the uh, whole uh, idea of spook shows. Well, uh, most of my pickups I normally hold until the patrons, but this one is so different and off the wall that I figured I'd share it tonight, especially because I think uh, you will especially appreciate this. I've not really been huge into autographs for most of my life. Um, starting around 2019, I started just casually coming across a couple, and I had a friend that got this autographed himself, so I, I do know that this is a good, legit autograph, but... Uh, we we were already about to trade some other things so i was like hey i mean what are you looking at and that for value wise and he's like eh I, I think you'll like it more than me you're already giving me a good deal i'll just throw it in i was like for a throw in this is pretty sweet so i have always loved an american werewolf in london it is just one of the best films of all time and one of the reasons is because of the breakthrough in makeup that they did in this the special effects are stupendous and with that recent arrow release they put out this wonderful poster and now i have an autograph from rick baker oh nice on this poster and i will be framing this very very soon absolutely um yeah that was that was really neat of him and i i really appreciate it so Yes, I I got Rick Baker's autograph, uh, Sibner. I'm so stoked to have this, and uh, it it will go 
along with a handful of others that are in here, and uh, I will keep special. Uh, the the other one besides this that I'm very happy to have is I have a ghost face mask from Scream that is autographed by Matthew Lillard. And he, as a person, uh, on top of the way that he is a, an incredible actor, he is a person is probably one of the nicest people in this industry that I've ever been able to meet. He is incredibly kind. He's thoughtful. He cares about, like, the biggest, most famous thing about him in the convention circuit over the last handful of years is how he treats uh, people with disabilities, people with special needs, and he's just remarkably kind and selfless. And I'm so stoked to be able to have a uh, mask with his signature on it. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for some announcements? I did want to sneak in one more um, oh, as sort it, of yeah. a recent, wa recent watch that turned into a pickup. That's right. Um, I had this um, sitting on my DVR, um, had heard plenty of conversation about it. Um, I think most recently on uh, the Pure Cinema podcast, uh, but I went ahead and watched, finally watched um, Pre Maids All in a Row. So I uh, went ahead and um, I know Warner Archive is getting more active now, and that's fantastic, but I just had to go ahead and pick up the uh, DVD because as much as I think this is worthy of a blue, I just don't think it's... It, th there's just too many things about this yeah. movie that's just going to make it difficult for people to really want to get behind putting it back out. Well, and they seem to really be focusing on like 37 through 55 <laughs> lately, so... Yeah, we'll we'll see about that one. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, it's been a really slow week for announcements. Uh some of these are are really interesting though, so I am stoked that you get to speak about them with me. Let's do it. Uh first up, Third Window Films is giving us a little box set. We are getting uh Katsuhito Ishii, I believe is how you say his name. This is the individual that gave us Funky Forest and Warp Forest, I believe. And uh, the uh, Adam from Third Window did a little poll on social media a handful of months ago and uh, kind of gave away that he was going to be doing this and said, if I release this, uh, would you want Funky Forest and Warp Forest in the box set with this? So you could have everything. Uh, just keep in mind, I'll have to charge like $10 more to do it. Or would you want just everything else to supplement it? And everybody overwhelmingly voted, leave them out. I'll pay less. Oh, we've already picked it up from you. So thankfully... Uh, he did leave those out, and this looks like a pretty sweet little box set. We got a limited edition three-disc digipack Blu-ray with all six movies in here. Uh, there is a lot of stuff. This is limited to 2,000 uh, copies, by the way, but it's ranging from 1995 all the way up to 2022, which uh, for somebody that has done, uh, uh, what, seven, eight full-length movies? That's a pretty good size box set for him. Um these we've got some special features we got some new interviews and audio commentary uh video essay uh some alternate endings archival interviews uh not a ton on here especially considering each of the discs has two films so they don't have a ton of room left but this looks like a pretty sweet release are you into uh any third window films releases um i did one of the while I'm still working through it, one of my favorite releases of last year was the Obayashi 80s uh, uh, box set. Um, I was pretty excited about that one just because I wanted something besides uh, House to uh, latch on to as much as I love that movie. I, if I, you know, watch 10, 10 more films and just get one more like House yeah. would, would be amazing. So uh, to hear that the guy from Funky Forest uh, is behind this um definitely has just talking here now uh definitely raised my uh interest in uh, seeking this one out because uh checked out a few episodes of the third window podcast um mm. really uh enjoy uh what they bring to the table there and um yeah it, it's one of those things it's just you know here's what i want Here's the budget I got. We'll meet somewhere in the middle, and hopefully this will be one of the things that get, gets caught within it. Third Window is always one of those tough ones for me because it's one person pouring their heart out, and I just want to be like, you you deserve my money. Come on. You exactly. can take it. <laughs> uh, what's going on, KB? 
Uh, Spaghetti says, I got that huge Rick Baker coffee table book. I'm so jealous. That thing, I'm so, so jealous. That thing looks incredible. Uh, Josephine, as someone on the spectrum that makes me happy, you and me both. That's exactly why I brought it up. Uh, next one, let's see. Welgo USA is giving us Sakura from this year. I know that a lot of people have been talking about this one because it has Donnie Yen in it. It is getting a Blu-ray release. You can pre-order this now. Uh, when I posted this, they didn't have any of the features up, but it's Welgo. And honestly, they're, they're normally not super heavy on the features anyways. So I wouldn't be expecting too, too much from this. Uh, next one, though, this is one that we can expect a lot from. <laughs> so uh, this one is going to be multiple posts to cover. Uh, there was literally just too much to put in one, so there's a ton of details. Uh, supposedly, we still don't have all of the details, and we're going to find out more in uh, about eight days from now. They're going to announce everything on this box set next Friday. Uh the uh, 28th of april we'll, we'll be hearing more about this but you can pre-order this now and it seems to be selling pretty damn well and i'm talking about arrows bruce lee at golden harvest box set uh there are some 4k films in here there are some blu-ray films in here first off terry any history with blue, uh, bruce lee i uh, limited um i know growing up we had um um don't know if it was like an official bio. I still have it float. I meant to bring it in tonight, but it, with all the other stuff that I was pulling together for this, uh, it was the one thing I did forget. Uh, but yeah, Bruce Lee was always a name known uh, in my house pretty much from from the day I was born. Um, had a couple, uh, had a set of nunchucks floating around here at, at one point. Uh, might still have them floating around here for all I know. <laughs> but um Going forward, though, and that was part of the reason why I did, uh, despite the rumblings of this box set, uh, what, probably a couple years ago now, it feels like. Uh, is, is that overestimating? No, overestimating I, it? I had somebody confirm this to me off mic last January of, of 2022 and okay. said, just so you know, there is a 4K Bruce Lee box set coming. So in spite of such rumblings, uh, because most of my experience with Bruce Lee had been revisiting Enter the Dragon every time it went on a new format, um, I did go decide to go ahead and pick up the, uh, the Bruce Lee set from uh, Criterion. Um, I haven't taken a hard look at uh, just every little feature. And you know, from what you're saying, we don't even know everything yet. But if there's enough features on the criterion that might be unique, that might still be enough for me to justify holding on to it, if I'm being honest, especially considering that'll, if I get a hold of this, that'll keep me from buying any sort of possible 4K from criterion if right. and when that comes down the line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dead Sea Life heard that they're not all 4K. Uh, Enter the Dragon is a Blu ray disc, it is not the 4K disc, and that's because it's being released on its own. And uh, that is a little exclusive like that. Um, yeah, it's not getting a new scan like the other films. It is pretty damn great looking, though. Uh, I will say, the biggest thing for me, um, what Sibner says right here, damn them in their exclusive yellow box, which we'll look at in just a moment, but uh, says, I can't drop that amount. Um, I'm, I'm hoping for overstock and see if it hits Hamilton book. Bad news there generally hamilton doesn't get uk arrow releases they tend to only get us arrow releases and this is only coming in the uk uh the date on this one is july 17th but the the hard part to swallow with this one is the price it is uh i believe in us dollars if you bought it day one was 177 dollars that is a lot for a box set, no matter what is in it, what's on it, how many 4K films. That's a lot of money. Um, I just thinking about it, I don't think I've spent that much retail for something. I think the closest recently, I mean, granted, I ended up getting the big bundle when I did it, but I mean, even the Steckler. Right. Box well, a, was, a bundle's was one, a little different. Yeah, but I mean, if, even if you broke that out of it, that was selling by itself for one fifty from them. So, right. but yeah, 
yeah, it's this is not the first time that's happened with oh, oh boy. T Ray says Australian dollars two hundred and fifty six shipped. Uh, yeah, that's Ouch. crazy. No, Sibner, that's uh, that's with shipping. One hundred seventy seven shipped from the UK to the US. It's it's a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, what I was thinking, I'm going to switch over from my normal view and look at the Arrow uh, website for this one, just so we can get the full details appropriately. So this says, brand new 4K restorations of The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, The Way of the Dragon, and Game of Death, and then a brand new 2K restoration of Game of Death 2. 4K UHD presentations in Dolby Vision of The Big Boss, The Big Boss, The Mandarin Cut, Fist of Fury, The Way of the Dragon, and Game of Death, with the Blu-ray presentation of the Hong Kong cut of Game of Death, Game of Death 2, Bruce Lee, The Man and the Legend, and Bruce Lee, The Legend. So there are uh, a little bit of Blu-ray releases in here, a little bit of 4K, uh, more 4K than Blu-ray, and we're getting cool, new, exciting things. I mean, the Big Boss, the Mandarin cut is one that people have been wanting for a long time. The releases on this, there, there are multiple alternate cuts on most of the films, including the extended Mandarin cut on that Big Boss release, English export cuts of the Big Boss and Fist of Fury, Japanese cut of The Way of the Dragon, Hong Kong cuts of Game of Death and Game of Death 2, new commentaries by David Desser, Jonathan Clements, Frank Jang and Michael Wirth, Brandon Bentley, and Mike Leader. There's a new documentary by Matt Rutledge on the original locations for the Big Boss, New deleted scenes, two new documentaries on Lee's fighting and working methods, new interviews with actors, a brand new feature length video essay by uh, Arrow on Lee's original vision for the game of death. Like, there is so much that's going to be in this. And then, on, of course, it's a nice box set, a 200 page hardbound book featuring new writing by Walter Cha, Henry Blythe, Andrew Staten, Dylan Chung, David West, and James Flower. This is a lot. A whole lot. Ah, that, that's a good call. The Severn All the Haunts by itself may have been around that price. Yeah. That could be. Uh, KB says, first quarter 2024 for the U.S. release. Honestly, that is probably very, very far from the truth. Uh, these Asian releases cost a lot more to release in the U.S., I don't see it coming to the U.S., actually. I could see them doing individual releases, uh, one at a time, like every few months, maybe. I do not see getting this box set in 4K in the U.S. That that would be exponentially more expensive than the U.K. for them. <sighs> I, I can't even imagine how much that they would charge for some of those. And I'm kind of w I'm wondering when... Uh, I mean... I hope they don't, but part of me seeing here, like, at what point are they going to get wise and realize that so many Americans are going to be trying to import this in and end up trying to bump the price up for, you know, these UK yep. releases? Yeah, and not just UK. I mean, everybody is importing stuff. It could be anywhere in the world. And now just start being exorbitantly priced no matter where you go. That would be rough. Yeah. Uh, hello, Sister Agatha. We all know who that is. Nice to see you, Erica. Uh, all the haunts went down to $89 on the Hamilton book. I'm still hoping that Severin does, uh, when I interviewed David and, and Andrew last November or whatever, or October, I think it was, but, uh, they, they seemed to hint that there was a volume two. I sure hope that that, that is coming eventually. Uh, Dead Sea Life says, I don't think it will go that low, but I think it'll be around long enough to see it hit 110. And honestly, I would not be surprised if it did, uh, especially with how, I, I don't want to say too quick, but some of those Shoscope sets hovering around like $60 in the US, that's very low for those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that yellow exclusive edition that we just talked about is this gorgeous box. This is only available from the Arrow website. Uh, they say full artwork and extras will be revealed on the 28th of April. So, yes, uh, we got a couple more reconnected until we hear about all of this. This box does look glorious, though. Um, and then on top of that, this will be a great companion piece for that uh, upcoming Severn Bruce Lee, or, or sorry, Bruce Lai box set. 
Uh, they are premiering their documentary on that at Tribeca. And I believe the announcement said June. So this will be this will be pretty damn good to put with that set if you got both. This is a glorious design, though. I I wish I had just an extra two hundred dollars laying around for this. Uh, but then we got some exciting stuff from Criterion. Terry, you like Criterion stuff, don't you? I do. Uh, so this month, I am so stoked that we got some some titles that people have been wanting for a long time. So first up, from 1996, we're getting The Watermelon Woman from Criterion on July 11th. Uh, this is getting a 2K digital restoration supervised by the director. Uh, we got a new interview with the director, new conversation between the director and Martin Sims, new conversation between Juhas and filmmaker and film scholar Thomas Allen Harris, uh, but the cool thing, six early short films by the director as well. This uh, looks like a, a pretty worthwhile release with everything that's coming with it. It's not not always common that we get a commentary and criterion stuff nowadays. So this is pretty nice. Yeah, this was as we were talking just before uh, we went live. Uh, this was the movie I was going to try to uh, check out in advance, but didn't. And the big reason was, is I was watching the extra features on Party Girl and found out the person who was behind the soundtrack for that film worked on the music supervision for this film. And that immediately raised my curiosity for it. Yep. Terry and music always <laughs> hand in hand. Uh, next up, probably the most requested criterion title for the last oh, I don't know, five years at the very least. July 11th, we are getting After Hours from 1985, but also it is coming on 4K. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a title more requested other than this one uh, for Criterion. This is, this is something that immediately you could hear white men that uh, travel to Barnes & Noble at least 14 times a year just go, ah... <laughs> <laughs> so how soon do we start uh asking for bringing out the dead uh i mean i have already been requesting that one for a while so i'm, I'm gonna keep staying on that one kb's all about that life i know that he's gonna have it day one probably yeah it would, uh i've lost track which month of releases are we looking at here these are all july so they are coming out during the sale excellent it is the best part. So this should only be 25 bucks in July. Yeah. Uh, this gets, of course, a new 4K restoration approved by the editor with uncompressed mono soundtrack. Uh, in the 4K, there's going to be one 4K of the film presented in Dolby Vision and one Blu-ray of the film with special features. There is a new program featuring Scorsese, uh, interviewed by writer Fran Lebowitz, an audio commentary from 2004 with Scorsese, uh, Schoonmaker, director of photography, Michael Ballhouse, uh, author and producer Griffin Dunn, and producer Amy Robinson, with additional comments recorded this year, which is an interesting setup. Uh, documentary about the making of the film featuring Griffin Dunn, Robinson, and Schoonmaker. New program on the look of the film featuring the costume designer. Some deleted scenes, trailer, and then, of course, an essay by critic Sheila O'Malley. This is July 11th. Uh, let's see. Spaghetti says after hours, or I hear a whole lot of there will be blood as runner up in that category request. Yeah, that's for sure. That would definitely be a good one. If uh, they really wanted to do like a extras filled uh, release of it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Erica says everyone has that one movie that everybody loves, but you don't His, hers is after hours. I honestly, I get it. It's it's not even I I mean KB and I talked about Scorsese. I don't think After Hours was even top seven or so for each of us. And it, I mean it's kind of weird how it's been this often requested title. I mean it's seemed like its cult has grown in recent years, but even even from I mean I don't have that good of a memory of like right when it first came out, even on VHS. But it it's just we all have our favorite filmmakers and there's these one, these quiet ones that just bury in the filmography that, you know, become, become a very nice little curiosity. And this one is just that, but because it's Scorsese, it's, you know, elevated that much more. 
Yeah, that's true. So. Uh, let's see. Sibner says it's unique. It's the outlier of all of his work. Obviously, completely agree there. I still wish he did a straight up horror movie. Like Shutter Island is close, but I would love to see him go all in on even like a like a, a New York alleyway type of like even seven type would be very close to what he could do. Uh, Dead Sea Life says his is a Halloween. I think that's becoming less of a hot take nowadays. Anyways, uh, July 18th, Criterion is going all in on 4K, and we are getting the renowned Westerns, five films by Bud Bedeker with the Tall T, Decisions at, uh, Decisions at Sundown, Buchanan Rides Alone, Ride Lonesome, and Comanche Station. Uh, this is really damn cool, obviously, that these are coming to 4K. It's not super often that we get these types of films in 4K, let alone these types of films that are about to be 70 years old. Uh, this is a really cool set coming from them. I don't love these films personally, but I am impressed that they're willing to go about doing this. Uh, we've got three 4K discs of the films, and they do have Dolby Vision. Uh, there's some new introductions on here. There's three audio commentaries, um, some audio conversation, Super 8 home movie versions of Comanche Station, an essay by Tom Gunning. Um, yeah, a, a lot lot in this. But uh, Westerns, I don't think you and I have ever talked about Westerns. How do you feel about Westerns? The ones that I really, the ones that I like, I really, really like, but it, as a as a genre overall it's definitely one that i have like huge holes in um yeah and it's not for you know my my dad to his credit definitely tried to uh, along with science fiction were was uh two genres that he would expose me to a lot growing up but yeah westerns didn't take as well as yeah. you know, science fiction did yeah, I, I watched quite a few when I was younger, and I don't hardly remember any of them nowadays, but I just did not like them at all. But the thing is, it's definitely because of, I, I think, the way my viewing habits have evolved over the years and getting to understand how other filmmakers have been influenced by Westerns. It's definitely a genre that it, it's definitely worth revisiting, especially if we we haven't had a real revival and so I'm trying to think here. I feel, I feel like I'm going to misspeak here, but I don't feel like we've had a, a big Western revival uh, in a while. Not, not in film at least. I mean, you could yeah. watch one of the 17 Taylor Sheridan shows on TV that are Western focused, but uh, you know, there's been a handful of, of pretty wonderful modern Westerns. I mean, the proposition is incredible. Uh, gosh, the, some of the other Taylor Sher Sheridan films you could also count as a Western, but I mean, even uh, th there's so many that have been recent too that are borderline Western or thematically feel Western that you could throw into it. Right. Um. I, d I don't know. It's, I, it just doesn't seem like it would be great for modern tastes almost. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is probably a, a too simple of a uh, of a way of comparing it, but I mean, there was a time that like westerns were getting cranked out the way superhero movies get cranked yeah. out now. And, and honestly, even worse. <laughs> and I don't think that's going to ever return. So yeah. the fact that we have thing, you know, collections like this to go back and see what was done with the genre, I, I, it's definitely uh, uh, something to be excited about. That's true. I am loving all the comments about Scorsese doing horror films. Sibner says he wants to see a Scorsese do a Jack the Ripper film. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That would be amazing. Uh, he said, imagine if Scorsese did a remake of Massage Parlor Murders. Oh, uh, no. Uh, hopefully it would be a little more exciting. Uh, Spaghetti says, Scorsese's chud. Now that, that is amazing. Like, I would help fund that right now. Please. Oh, gosh, that would be incredible. Yeah, Bone Tomahawk is another big one, obviously. Yeah. Unforgiven, Dances with Wolves, two movies that won Best Picture alone, two years apart. Yeah, the 90s was the last a little heavier big, on it. Yeah, that felt like the late 80s, early 90s felt like the last big film revival. Of, but uh, Tombstone, in the moment, I just felt like I was yeah. forgetting something else. Yeah. 310 to Yume remake is really good. Yeah, for sure. True Grit, the remake is really great. Yeah. 
Uh, let's go to the next one, which is another 4K release, and it's Godard's Breathless. I think a lot of people expected this, so this was not really a surprise. Uh, but once again, no new art, no new features, just a 4K disc. And uh, again, for getting some of these with uh, a solid release, I'm not against it necessarily. It just hurts when it feels like they're taking the place of other films getting a good release. So, yeah, Godard. Uh, Key Ray says, man with no name, trilogy is a must, of course. Uh, but then, uh, this might even be the one that I'm most excited about from this month. Uh, July 25th, Criterion on 4K is giving us one false move from 1992. Incredible cast in this one. It's a Carl Franklin film. We got Bill Paxton, Billy Bob Thornton, Cinda Williams, Michael Beach. Uh, this one is a really, really great movie. Uh, on the release, we have an audio commentary from 99 with Franklin on it. New conversation between Franklin and Billy Bob Thornton. And that's it. Like, there's an essay by author William Boyle, but I, I feel like they really let up on the extras for this, which really saddened me. Um, for those of you that got the imprint box sets, uh, the Neo Noir After Dark, this is in, oh gosh, uh, Tony, if you're watching, which one is it in? I, I think it's in the second one. I feel like it is. Um, but yeah, it's in one of them, and it's a it's a great movie. Absolutely great movie. Stoked that it's getting a 4K. Have you seen One False Move? If I did, it was very early on, and not that it I, it didn't leave enough of an impression for me to remember. But I mean, what, what was it? Ni early nineties, so ninety six. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, this is definitely uh, one that I uh, will uh, want to uh, give a look look to. Uh, Eric says it's in the first Neo Noir set. Thanks, Eric. Oh, Sibner says it thinks it's in the second. It's probably the first. That that does sound correct. Uh, that is it for Criterion. Uh, Kino is giving us the White Dawn soon. This is from 1974. This one, kind of kind of soft on it at first, but then I started reading into it. War Notes, Timothy Bottoms, Louis Gossett Jr., directed by Philip Kaufman. This looks and sounds great, and it's getting a 4K scan of the OCN. I mean, I'm sure this will be on sale for like $9 a few months after release. This will be a great buy. That uh, also seems like it would make a... Uh, I don't know if I would need that like a full-size poster, but something bigger than uh, the the uh, Blu-ray box would yeah. be nice for that one. Yeah, something like this. I, I would hope this would be the slipcover. Uh, next up, we are getting a 3D release from Kino of The Man Who Wasn't There from 1983. 3D Film Archive is doing the 3D restoration on this, and it's got uh, 4K scans of the OCN. Pretty pretty damn great. Steve Gutenberg film, Jeffrey Tambor, not problematic at all. Uh, <laughs> William Forsyth is in this as well, directed by uh, Bruce Melmuth, who did Nighthawks and Hard to Kill. Um, fun cast. I, I don't think I've seen this. I feel like I should have remembered it because e even in the early revival of 3D, that was uh, in the 80s. That was something that I have memories of. I I, yeah. so I had like a my dad ended up going to see Space Hunter, and I happened to keep the 3D glasses from that one. So that one was odd that it wasn't the red and blue like we associate with like 50s and 60s uh, 3D. Um, but yeah, I, I whenever 3D Film Archive, regardless of who they team up with, uh, they put something out. I won't say I get every single one, but it's definitely an announcement that I'm always excited to hear that uh, they're coming up with another title. Same. And a lot of their uh, 3D releases, like even uh, Joe Jack here says, are any of these 3D films that Kino releases any good? I got to admit, I think most of their 3D releases have been pretty great, actually. I can um, definitely speak the dynasty. That was even with the red and blue. That was uh, a lot of fun to watch. Well, and there's been, I don't, is it every single release that you can watch with the red and blue or if you have a 3d player? Um, I want to early on, I think they were just 3d exclusive, but I think right around the time of, uh, 
uh, dynasty and revenge of the Shogun women, they ended up going to that. Uh, okay. To, to where it was both. So some of the earlier ones, less or so, but um, I'd say within the last, let's see, about four years or so, um, you're you're going to have a way to watch it in 3D, whether you have a TV, TV equipped for it or not. Yeah, they uh, for a while there, they were doing like one of these every year. And then it seems like they're stepping up a little bit to maybe two a year. Uh, I, I still want to know how well these are selling and if people are actually watching them in 3D. If you try with the glasses, they, they don't look bad at all. It's it's certainly worth it. Yeah, I think unfortunately, and as someone who I never projected 3D, but as someone who was a projectionist, it kind of saddens me a little bit. I think some of the bad experiences that people had watching uh, 3D prior to going everything going digital was yep. just simply a matter of projection projectors or projectionists not setting up their projectors properly yep. or maintaining that. Or if you're one of the unfortunate people who just like mentally can't handle 3D, so you get a headache every time, or it's uncomfortable because you already wear glasses. I mean, there's there's a handful of things that make it worse, and I get that fully. But if you're comfortable, a lot of these are a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, next up, another Kino title. June 20th, we are getting Ronin on 4K. This is from 1998. This was previously released by Arrow, and a lot of people had that release, and then it went out of print kind of suddenly. But oddly, this was available very cheap for a long time. I think I mentioned last week as well, there was, a, there was an MVD sale where this was on sale with the slipcover, the limited version, for five dollars and they didn't sell out during that entire sale it was five dollars for multiple days and uh it did very well for them but um yeah ronin i i i get ronin it's it's decent i'm not the biggest fan of ronin i think that some of the other ones from around this time are much much better uh i obviously i prefer heat way way more than this but it, it looks like a pretty great release. I think this has most of the previous uh, bonus features. Looks like a great title. Is it one that I have to have in 4K? I don't know. What do you think about Ronin? It's one of the De Niro titles that just uh, slipped by me back in the day and uh, definitely recognize that there's some love for it and maybe this... I, I don't know if I need to go straight to 4K f for one like this, but maybe this gets me back to at least giving it a look uh, well at least it'll be in print that's the biggest thing. exactly yeah this does have a pretty great car chase uh joe jack and sibner certainly there to defend the car chase immediately um i put out an interview with canny or sorry i said their name wrong even after i look at it uh put an interview out with connie this week i hope uh, people watch that connie has not gotten enough love and uh they are a wonderful wonderful pair of people so please support them um, the draftman's, the drafts men's contract. This is a hard title to say. Uh, this one is a film that is from 1982 and it's coming to zeitgeist films, which is a partner of Kino Lorber. This is getting the BFI restoration on this. Uh, this was a 4k restoration and suddenly it seems like Greenaway is getting a whole lot of love. Uh, we got this, we got the drowning by numbers that just came from Severin. Kino's putting out some other greenaways as well. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just curious where some of the bigger greenaway titles are. We're we're pretty quiet on some of them. Yeah, I think we haven't heard anything yet on Belly of the Architect. I think uh, I feel like there's a Kino. Uh, there's one that's up for pre-order, and that might be a part of it. Let me see. Because that's the one other than the cook, the thief wife and her lover that uh I've, I've seen that one but belly of the architect was one that uh, i remember hearing uh, really strong uh things about back in the, back in its time so the other one that is up for pre-order that technically hasn't been announced yet is a Z and two knots and the falls uh this one is going to be coming on june 20th as well we'll probably get the announcement for that tomorrow uh of course uh, oh, Mondo's here. What's going on, Mondo? Will is watching live. Uh, <laughs> Sibner says, I, tell you, I feel like taking a nap by looking at the cover. 
<laughs> oh man. Uh, Mondo says we'd love to see more Greenaway titles come to 4K or Blu-ray. Uh, he's one word fellow. Yes, he is a weird yes. fellow. That's for sure. I need to get that Severin 4K for sure. Uh, we got some more archive announcements. In May, we are getting The Boy with Green Hair from 1948. This got a lot of people super excited. Uh, this has a classic short a subject, a really important person with Dean Stockwell, and the trailer is coming on this one. Then we are also getting The Courtship of Eddie's Father. This one has uh, little Ronnie Howard in it. And uh, special features, classic MGM Tom and Jerry cartoon, Penthouse Mouse, and the original trailer. This one, of course, has Glenn Ford and Shirley Jones in it. Then uh, my most uh, anticipated in May is this one called Hey There, It's Yogi Bear from 1964. This is going to have a 1961 special episode from the Yogi Bear show called Yogi's Birthday Party. And that looks great. Uh, and it's also, I believe, uh, yeah, his first full-length movie, which uh, I used to love Yogi Bear. Then we're getting King Solomon's Mines from 1950. This is a Deborah Kerr film. This one is going to have a behind-the-scenes featurette called Jungle Safari in HD even for a 1950 film. That's pretty damn great. And then I clicked the wrong thing, but uh, we got one more coming, which is Queen Christina with Greta Garbo. This is from 1933. Nice pre-code title. And uh, we're getting an episode of MGM Parade television series on the career of Greta Garbo at the studio and the original trailer. So, Warner Archive. How are you feeling about Warner Archive lately? Um, it's... I'm very selective about it. It's um, nothing against what they're doing. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I'm definitely glad they're getting more active again. Um, couldn't be more excited about the uh, Looney Tunes release that we're getting uh, also at the end of, end of May. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to make a point of that being a day, day one pickup because they've made it perfectly clear that if we're going to see anything more, and we barely, I mean, we got three Blu ray, uh, um, three Blu ray volumes. Well, not from Warner Archive, but Warner Brothers proper. We got uh, uh, three volumes of Looney Tunes previously. Yeah. Uh, I actually had to, because I, you know, volume two was one that mysteriously went out of print. And that was one of the things I picked up early on when I got the region free player because. Uh, apparently overseas, it's perfectly uh, uh, easy. It's a lot easier to get over there and remarkably cheap, all things considered. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to see them get back back on that before you know, the elements uh, with those uh, cartoons uh, get away from us. Yeah, I, I agree. And the hard part with Warner Archive is it's, it's hard to... I, I don't want to say the word complain, but it's hard to like even point out it sucks that we're only getting stuff from the mid 1930s to the late fifties or early sixties, whatever. But the reality is they have the rights to so many important films in film history that I, I just want them to release like 20 titles a month. Not that I can even buy any of them. <laughs> just so that they're out there. I want people to be happy. And there's so many, like the amount of a animation that they own the rights to the amount of, uh, massive Hollywood names that they got literally every single film that they were attached to and they released. The the amount of titles that they have on DVD that haven't made the way to, to Blu-ray yet. Yeah, I, I mean, there are so many incredible Warner Archive titles that they could release and we're, we're just getting the same similar feeling things every single month. I don't know. Next up. Uh, in the UK, they are getting a 4K of Cocaine Bear. Um, this one, I really only wanted to put on here because it's super interesting that the UK is getting some of these genre titles that are modern films coming out immediately on 4K, but we're not getting them in the US, and I don't know why that is. It's, it's rather sad, but it looks like some of these other modern films are going to be following suit. I would not be surprised to see this continuing from excuse me, uh, from Universal especially. I, I don't know why. It makes zero sense to me. 
I don't know. I'm, I can't remember if this was something that I might have read in the Discord. Someone was just, uh, you know, putting an opinion or a theory out. Um, I, I, I'll take it one step further. I'm kind of wondering if they're going, if this is something that hasn't been made clear to us yet. But if, I'm wondering if Universal is doing this to like give like shop slash Screen Factory um, mm. the 4K down the line. And this is just something they're not going to make, you know, put right out there. Because obviously right now they want people to go and buy the Universal Blu-ray release that just came out and, you know, not seek out 4K elsewhere. But I know that would be rough. That's for sure. I hope not. I mean, I, w- I like this movie a little bit more than, than, than some. Uh, it, but to those folks, it hasn't. Uh, stayed with me as well as I thought it would right. uh, since seeing it, but um, it's one that I'll eventually want to have in the collection. Yeah, I, I thought it was fine. It, it wasn't a landmark film. I think that there was maybe maybe just a couple too many characters in this movie, and if they just focused on the damn bear a little bit more, it probably would have risen a whole star for me, because it, it was fun, had a good premise, the acting was pretty well done, I just want, I mean, it's called cocaine bear. I want more bear. (laughs) Yeah, it was, I think I was listening to an interview with Elizabeth Banks right around the time of seeing the movie. And she made the comment that that's the the one thing that you're, you're bringing up as a criticism is something that she apparently likes to do with her stories, which she likes to have lots of characters in them. So I don't know how that's going to evolve going forward. If, you know, (laughs) studio notes come back to her at some point saying like, you could help yourself here with this, but yeah. um, I'm glad it's out there. Um, If it wasn't (laughs) for the fact that May is already going to be enough as is uh, I would consider possibly consider this but it's it's again like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about tonight it's just good it's out there well on the bright side it is region free and i bet orbit will get this in because they've been getting a lot of even just the regular mainstream titles so yeah uh this comment though is freaking hilarious uh sibner says i swear if megan 4k is a screen factory exclusive with damn megan lobby cards (laughs) uh, (laughs) 40 dollar picture of, of megan doing her dance like yeah yeah, I could see that happening. Sad, well, they could do actually what they could do one side and then do the flip where it's like her and four like different poses of the dance on the other side. There you either, go. Either that will justify it. They'll raise the price from forty dollar lobby cards to forty five and make them holograms. <laughs> uh, Kino, they are giving us the Mr. Wong collection on June 20th. We'd already had this announced previously, but we didn't know all the extras. Um, so we got some details on this. June 20th, like I said, brand new HD masters from 2K scans of the fine, fine green elements. We had a new audio commentary for Mr. Wong Detective by Tom Weaver and Larry Blamir. And I think that's it. Uh, they, they're not giving us much of anything else on this. It's a two disc set, but it's a whole lot of Boris Karloff and it's, uh, yeah. Mr. Wong detective. When I saw this announcement, I just flashed back to, uh, the nineties. Cause I remember seeing some of like some of the pictures that we see here, the little posters on the bottom of that in a uh, cult movie movies yeah. magazine and it just like that's that was you know a, a whole avenue of cult films back then so um for folks that were excited about them then they should be really excited about something like this coming along i've not seen any of these ones i don't think my family was big on the charlie chan films so i've seen quite a few of those but yeah never never a mr wong movie uh next up one that has gotten a lot of wonderful reactions to this announcement. Kino and 3D Archive, 3D Film Archive, sorry, is getting together again, coming on June 27th. Emphasis on the word coming. Uh, we are getting Prison Girls in 3D. This is newly restored in 3D by the 3D Film Archive. New audio commentary by HorrorFix.com's James G. Chandler and Ash Hamilton. There's a deleted scene on this. But uh, this is literally an adult film. Uh, 
this is kind of surprising that Kino is putting this out. They even have the tagline, the first real adult film in 3D. Um, yeah. Cool? It's a little off-brand for them. I don't think there's... I mean, it's either going to be your bag or it's not. There's not right. really any sort of push that can be made here on this. Um, perhaps bad word choice. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's... Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm curious. Uh, with Kino doing this again, 3D Film Archive. Um, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful comedic timing joe jack yeah uh yeah I, I i don't have anything against this coming out i honestly i will probably get it eventually um this is super intriguing and i am into the 3d aspect of it uh nothing against uh them putting it out it's just a little off brand and for a company that really emphasizes like the older generation of viewers and people purchasing from them and the paper catalog and nine dollar titles and all of that stuff it just seems a little odd for them but that's totally okay <laughs> next up uh we had a fun show last night give it a watch if you are into that uh okay so this one i did want to shout out a couple things real quick since i'm always terrible at talking about myself a little bit. One, uh, sign up for the Patreon. Uh, hopefully Terry will agree it's a pretty worthwhile thing. Terry's already won some physical media in a drawing. Terry's very active in our Discord. We're, we're wonderful together. Uh, but one of the other things, I never talk about uh, merch. And it's the perfect day. It's 420 to highlight this wonderful shirt. I don't, I don't even smoke myself. But hey, I, I figured it was perfect time to make a shirt like that and put it out there. Uh, and then on top of that, if you are listening to the show or if you watch this every week and you're just feeling extra generous, go give a rating and a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you would ever listen to podcasts. It helps a lot, and I don't have a whole lot of those, and that would help. So thank you, if you already have. One thing that you I know you mentioned in the Discord that I'll go ahead and add in on the merch uh, just a little reminder. I think we have until the end of tomorrow. There's the sell on some of the merch. So yep. if you're on the fence about something, definitely go ahead. I have a couple of shirts myself. I can definitely speak for the quality of them. They're they're really good shirts. So, um, and, and a lot of them are are very witty, like the one that uh, Ryan is wearing this evening. And I also just got in another uh, shipment of stickers to put in all of my uh, Patreon packages. So. It's it's definitely worth it. John says the Discord rules. There's so many people in there. I love it. It's such a fun little community. Uh, we got some BFI announcements. June 19th in the UK, we are getting I Am Weekender. This is a new documentary from 2023 that is uh, including the original Weekender uh, release from 1992, I believe. Yes. Uh, it was a film ahead of its time, both in form and content. And this gets... A whole bunch of extra stuff. This seems like it's right up your alley, to be honest. Uh, this is following the band Flowered Up. Weekender explores the hedonistic side of club and drug culture in the UK. Um, it's got a whole bunch of promo videos, and it's got some uh, limited edition of 2,000 copies, including a slipcase. We got Super 8 footage that was filmed at a boys' own party in 1989. Uh, we got some writing in this book by some journalists. This sounds like a pretty fun release for BFI. It definitely a a, a uh, obviously not being in the UK obviously have some distance from it but reading up on this one a little bit uh, definitely recalls a period of of my life where I kind of drifted towards that more because of who I associated with than anything that I might have necessarily directly did but um, definitely a uh, a uh, study into uh, part of uh, UK culture that. Um, definitely would be worth checking out I think. absolutely their music scene around then was pretty incredible i gotta be honest uh next from bfi we are getting the driver's seat with elizabeth taylor this is from 1974 uh now i did want to point out to people just like i did for chris from they live by film uh this is the film that was in the severin release of the uh box set that just came out last year 
um, the House of Psychotic Women. This is Identikit, just with the alternate title. So if you already have the box set, you probably don't need this release. I don't think this gets anything singular from that release. Nope, they're all 2022 special features. So yeah, it's just a UK release of that film. Uh, next up, Western Approaches. This is directed by Pat Jackson, and it's one of the best British documentaries of the Second World War. Uh, I have never heard of this one. Uh, it's got a 2K restoration, archival audio commentary, and a whole bunch of documentary, short film, special features. And uh, it says other extras to be confirmed. They're going to be putting even more in here. This looks pretty great. John is saying Identikit is a great movie. Uh, next up from BFI, these uh, final two, these are books, not films, but we are getting The Cinema of Powell and Pressburger. This is 224 pages and uh, looks like a pretty great release. And then to accompany it, there is another release called The Red Shoes, uh, BFI Film Classics. This one is 112 pages. They are both coming out in October but you can pre-order them now. Uh, and then we got a couple sales still going on right now. So one, Oscilloscope Labs that we've talked about quite a few times on here, they're having a 420 sale. They always do. Uh, if you go on there and use the code Ocelloscope, you get 42% off your order. That's quite obvious uh, why they're doing that. Um, and then... Uh, OCN Distribution, who is the Vinegar Syndrome parent label, uh, they're having a 420 sale, and a whole bunch of the partner labels are on sale for $14.20 right now. It is an incredible deal for some of these. Um, one of them, uh, it, it's hard to recommend this, but Gunpowder and Sky put out a film called Awaken, and it is, uh, what I will still say, the best 4K disc I have ever seen, but it's not a great film. It's a wonderful demo disc. I don't watch it for the movie. I put it on because the visuals are incredible. I've used that disc a couple times to show people what it can look like on an OLED and how amazing it can look, but we never just want to sit and watch the whole movie. Uh, Sibner says, if you order with a pre-order, do they split orders? Or do you have to wait? I believe with BFI and most companies, you do have to wait, unfortunately. Uh, Sibner says, wish I could still sack on my April order, but with shipping, I might as well wait until the halfway sale. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on right now, that's for sure. Uh, but that is it. That's the last thing to talk about. Did you get anything from the Vinegar Syndrome sale today? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you pick up? Uh, I definitely picked up Awaken for reasons that will become uh, clear as we continue on here. Uh, it's actually sort of... Uh, in going through these announcements, I feel like there's little clues peppered in as to what we're going to be getting into uh, as we uh, go through our scores here in a bit. So that's kind of like, oh, the, yeah. Eric comments, uh, what, you don't watch all 47 people running in slow motion across the frame and awaken? <laughs> but yeah, I picked that up. Um, I picked up uh, the... Uh, Lee Scratch Perry doc just because I'm concerned was concerned that the limited was going to make it yeah. to the next cell and then um, I can't remember I'm, it, it's the one that looks like the VHS cassette the party one oh. I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head but that yeah. was the other one that I picked up yeah the it was getting low the Lee Scratch Perry, I don't think that has been out long enough to be on sale next month. It is, it just came out. So to have that for fourteen twenty, that is a great deal. Yeah, I, I almost went and got Low High Desert, but that one I feel like is going to probably stick around for a bit. Yeah, I think people have soured on on ETR a little bit, so yeah, would not surprise me. Uh, as usual, we'll go over uh, next week's uh, release list in case you forgot. Super Cop coming in 4K from 88 Films in the U.S. Triangle of Sadness 4K from Criterion. Uh, Action Mutante or Mutant Action from Severin. This is finally getting a retail release. The Jackie Chan Collection. This is Volume 2, right? Mm -hmm. 
I think it's volume, yeah, volume two. Cheers, the complete series comes out next week. The Man Who Fell to Earth is getting a 4K release from Lionsgate. So far, this is only a steelbook coming to Best Buy, so you may want to keep an eye out for that if you're super into the movie. Uh, Suicides Club, that one's coming from is that Media Blasters, I think. Uh, either way, uh, finally getting a release. I know that there was some controversy with Sion Sono. Um, Third Window Films had announced that they were going to release that, and now that there's some controversy with the director, I believe they have quietly canceled that. So, yeah, that uh, th- this may be the only release we're getting for a while. Uh, Backtrack with Dennis Hopper and Jodie Foster coming from Kino next week. The Shiver of the Vampires in 4K, the Jean Roulon film coming from Indicator. I know uh, Will is super excited about that one. Uh, the Big Bus coming from Kino next week. Safe in Hell from Warner Archive. Uh, then some other Warner Archives. One Way Passage, The Strawberry Blonde, and uh, the Small Axe set from uh, Steve McQueen coming from Criterion next week. And uh, Two Orphan Vampires. That's the other Roland film coming out next week. Uh, that's another 4K release from Indicator. The Assassination Bureau from Arrow. There's so much. Arrow... Or not just Arrow. April is huge for releases in the U.S. especially. Uh, Lover's Lane from Arrow. Heat from Kino. Terminal Invasion from Kino. Lion is in the Streets from Warner Archive. Uh, And then, of course, all of those partner label titles coming out soon as well. Calamity of Snakes from Unearth. I know a lot of people have been watching that. The Green Hornet from VCI. One of the the most prolific labels out there. Uh, Three Between the Sheets getting a retail release from Severin. And I think that is the bulk of it. Uh, the new Godfathers from Raro. Yep, I think that is it. Anything next week that you have on the way or are already picked up and you're stoked on? Um, I think there's uh, one or two of the partner label titles that I'll be getting. But uh, I wanted to get uh, and will eventually get Action Mutante. But I got... I ended up seeing Dave the Beast. I started Perdita Durango. I kind of want to revisit movie. those and then get get in with that one. Yeah. Okay. So Terry is here primarily to discuss music. So as we said, uh, it is record store day this weekend. And the first question, anybody uh, in the chat like super into vinyl or super into film scores or soundtracks in general? Uh, hopefully there is at least some, and this isn't, uh, too terribly, uh, just dry for everybody, but, um, it's physical media. That's the biggest thing is it's super important to, uh, support and keep going the other forms of physical media as well. I try to stay up to date on some of these, but there are so many vinyl releases nowadays that I, man, I, I focus too much on film. I, I can't stay up on vinyl like I used to at all. And the thing is, especially for one of the titles that I was thinking about for um, uh, to pick up on uh, Saturday, um, some of them, you know, I, I understand, you know, there's, you know, some of these get imported or some of them come from presses that, you know, can command a heavy premium when it comes to uh, cost of production. But uh, some of these vinyls are just... Uh, uh, are, are just uh, too expensive at times. And, you know, I, I still even now kind of work from the default of, of CDs. And then if I get, you know, if I, I, I like having things digitally now, I've definitely uh, evolved on that, but I'd still like, you know, the ideal and one of the reasons why um, I'll champion a, a website like Bandcamp is because they have a way of, putting those, those two things together where you, you make that physical purchase, you get a digital and either it's baked into the cost of it, or they're just basically giving it to you. Yeah. And on, on top of all that, Bandcamp is also one of the most ethical companies because they, they, they very much strive to pay fairly to all of their artists. They even have Bandcamp Fridays. I think that's once a month where yep. if, if you purchase on that day, the all of the profits go to that band themselves. And that's uh, that's not insignificant. That is a huge difference compared to some of these other where like to buy a T-shirt from a brand uh, from a band is exactly like streaming their song 50,000 times. 
So it, it really, really matters when you're supporting them the right way. Uh, with, with scores and soundtracks. So I have pretty much been leaning into the streaming method. Unfortunately, a lot of the ones that I've loved throughout the years are not even available on streaming. It's hard to find many of these. Uh, I also still have a ton of CDs. I've got a few hundred. I love when some of these releases come with CDs and I can take, uh, the CD and burn the, the soundtrack to my iTunes and save it in there so that I can always have it with me. It is so, so worth it. Um, I, I honestly wish more releases had them. I, I understand that it can be pricey, though. And I, if, if it means every every single release is $10 more, yeah, I probably don't want it. But yeah. uh, on the important ones, it's great. Like the guest having the, the CD soundtrack in there was huge for me. That is an incredible release. I love that film. Love that soundtrack. Uh, I, I think that was an absolutely essential one to have the CD in there. Yeah, it's definitely where I mean, I know we've mentioned it, um, or it has been mentioned on here, um, uh, in previous uh, reconnecteds. But uh, the one of the great things about Severin, and it's just a little bit of a minor disappointment with with, with uh, certain releases, is the fact that they do strive to uh, put the uh, soundtrack in in there on CD. It's yep. uh, it's definitely one of the things that will get my attention when they make a uh, announcement. Yeah. We we've only had like a few from vinegar syndrome have it. I think a few of the partner labels have had them, uh, but yeah, Severin doing usually like eight or 10 a year at least is really nice. Really nice. Uh, yet the, the big selling point of the imprint release of the haunting of Julia or full circle uh, is that it comes with the CD soundtrack and none of the other releases uh, in the, the rest of the world, there are four releases of that film. None of them have the soundtrack except for the imprint one. All right. Uh, record store day this weekend. Uh, do you want to go into what you have your eyes on or is that going to uh, encroach on your list that we're going to be talking about? No, no, not at all. Actually, uh, unlike it, while this overall is a very, um, is a much stronger list than uh, the past couple of years um more for budgetary reasons than anything else um my um my picks are very basic um and you just scrolled past or just scrolling past one of the ones that i had my eye on and again no nothing bitter about it but that oceans 12 uh score um it's one of the reasons why I will speak up for Ocean's 12 where like literally no one else will defend it. Um, that may be the best score of the three, but it's going for $55 um, mm. on Saturday. And as much as I would love to have it on vinyl, uh, it's, it's one of those, I like the two other titles that I want the most are going to end up, would end up basically being the same price. So it's Ouch. just like, yeah, it's kind of very easy for me to just prioritize um, to uh, uh, away from that one. Unfortunately, uh, I know Terror Vision uh, has uh, one coming out on Saturday. Uh, that would be uh, Harry, uh, Hello Mary Lou Prom Night Part Two. Um, that's a movie. If I'm being honest, I definitely warmed up to more after seeing it on. Um, uh, the last drive-in, I yeah. didn't remember loving it when I when I saw it at a younger age. But the, if I'm being also being honest, that score uh, didn't immediately jump out at me. So I don't know if it's. I, I'm glad they're putting it out. It's definitely going to uh, make some fans happy. I'm just not one that's going to be uh, seeking it out on Saturday. One of the sad things with that release is uh, that they had an exclusive colorway that was going to be going through mondo and now that mondo is dead terravision is just doing another exclusive colorway so there's uh so much that has disappeared with mondo and i sincerely hope they're able to keep going with the other stuff they can't be allowed to but we shall see i guess i'm kind of that makes me curious for what was you know already there because you know mainly because of shipping more than anything else. Um, there were some titles that I didn't, um, 
didn't pick up uh, from them that I would like to be able to go back and get. And I'm kind of wondering how, how difficult that's going to become here. Right. In time, really. Yeah. That's uh, it's rough for sure. And especially with like the state of the vinyl industry and how long delays have been for pressings. I, I guarantee that there are probably already things in planning for like the 2025 record store day. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Mondo had to just scramble at the last minute with tons of things already in production. Yeah. Sucks. Uh, although the one encouraging development um, this year is that when we did get the, uh, um, the list, um, cause the way they do it, um, at the stores, they have us uh, look at, at a menu and basically pick off what we want, and we turn that in, and the, they'll give us uh, what we want if they have it. And the uh, really cool development this time where a year ago, year and a half ago, the list of titles that were getting bumped was like a dozen or more. This year, it was just three titles. So yeah. that I felt was a huge win. Uh, on top of that, one of the coolest things about Record Store Day over the last couple of years is there's been a, a whole lot of premieres. Things that are uh, classic and not just things released in the last few years, but things from like the early 80s that never saw vinyl for some reason. And in 2022, getting its first printing ever like that, that is incredible. Yeah. I mean, and it goes in some cases can go even further back than than that. And, oh, yeah. You no, know, one of the comments you just posted there speaking uh, about jazz music there's uh i i haven't had time yet to explore it but the um the jazz titles uh, this year seem to be particularly strong i am i'm a huge fan of jazz i was in a jazz ensemble in high school i i try to do my best with staying on top of that but of course owning instruments is very expensive but uh jazz is a hell of a lot of fun to play hell of a lot of fun to listen to and it, it's genuinely iconic because of how long it's been around. It's it's something that uh, there's a jazz museum here in Kansas City, and it's it is a mind blowing place to visit. It, it is such a wonderful wonderful experience. Um, Sibner says, "What did I play in jazz band specifically? I played uh, baritone sax. Oh, look at that! You played alto sax. Yeah, I uh, I was the low end in jazz band, of course, being this massive person that I am." And then uh, I played bass clarinet as well. I've played guitar, uh, bass. I've played a little bit of drums, uh, played clarinet. Um, yeah, I've done, I've done as much as I could, basically. Uh, but yeah, I, I love Record Store Day. I love, I love vinyl. I, I'd much rather listen to vinyl I, if it wasn't so damn expensive. And if I still had a, a working turntable, I would be listening to vinyl far more often uh i do still have a i say small collection but i know it's bigger than a lot of people and i'm very fortunate to have it uh i've got probably 75 90 ish records something like that nothing huge but uh the ones that i have left are the ones that matter uh anything else on record store day that you want to highlight anything else uh, from the list jump out at you that you want to really show for people um I will just go ahead and mention real quick, since you were asking earlier what I what the things I was most having the eye on uh, was uh, on both ends of the exclusive section that you're going through here, and that would be the Tori Amos B sides, and um, there at the bottom there, uh, Wilco decided to. It started out as a CD, bonus CD. Um, for, for a magazine, but basically they took various versions of Yankee Hotel Foxtrot and Jigsaw puzzled it together into a new version of the record. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a mix of alternate takes, live recordings. Um, it's it, it's a particularly good experiment um, with it. Uh, it does include a few things that even if you just got the behemoth uh, set from... Uh, last year for the 20th anniversary there are a handful of cuts on there that weren't in, that are on this Jeez. uh because uh, they ended up may, mainly what they are are the um for the 20th anniversary they went and performed some shows where they played it front to back and they took a few cuts from that and put it on the uh on this new uh mix of it nice very nice 
All right, my friend. You want to get into our list then? Absolutely. Okay, so when we first determined what we were going to talk about tonight, it was all based around Record Store Day, and we said, let's just pick five of our favorite, five of our favorite, of our favorite, because I know I always get comments, these are not the best, five of our favorite iconic scores. And I I kind of struggled with this. Getting it down to a five list is really hard. Uh, I've got a couple honorable mentions. You want to go through some of yours first? Because I know you got some. Uh, the honorable mentions? Yep, let's do that first. Okay, sure. Um, what I did a little different um, with the honorable mentions, um, because as, you know, if you're someone who was looking forward to um, Hello, Mary Lou Prom Night 2 coming out on vinyl this Saturday, you know, maybe that's a, a holy grail that's coming off your list. Well, then you start thinking about, well, what about uh, yeah. titles to put on there going forward? Um, so with that in mind, um, I decided to go ahead and um, pull out some CDs of titles that, as far as I know, don't have vinyl releases. Um, this list kind of drifts a little bit away from pure score. Some of it's a mix of sound uh, songs and score, but that was the spirit that I went through this particular yeah. list. So. Uh, I'll go ahead and start um, a number of Wes Anderson's uh, titles have already gotten um, vinyl releases. Um, uh, the Darjean Limited is a particular favorite of mine if I'm thinking about ones that I have on vinyl. Um, but uh, I want to go ahead and highlight uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox um, as a pick. And not only just this and um, this and 500 Days of Summer both, I believe, came out in 2009. And in both cases, they put out a physical um, CD like this of a soundtrack, but then they ended up doing a digital exclusive of what would be a score. So for this one, we do have um, a score for... Uh, uh, all this being done, uh, well, being mixed at uh, Abbey Road Studios, but uh, this is, this expands upon some of the score selections that are on this particular CD, and this is a full disc. Um, much like the movie itself, uh, this is one that's, uh, for me, always one that comes around uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, another one here I just realized um, that is... Uh, holiday centric although uh, i can uh, listen to this one um pretty much uh, year round and that would be the uh soundtrack for uh, ed wood from uh, howard shore um i know there's probably some other howard shore scores that that aren't on vinyl yet that people probably would want more but this uh is a personal favorite of mine um after even after all these years i would say this this has now Locked its place is probably my favorite Tim Burton movie. Uh, I don't think there's any chance that that's going to um, get dislodged uh, unless he has a, you know, a third act that we just don't see coming. He had a mind blowing like nine years in a row around then. It was just ridiculously great. Yeah. And um, this one, I when I picked it. Um, I wanted to highlight some Hal Hartley as I've been doing a lot in the discord uh, as of late. Um, and I thought that this was going to be the first uh, of his films where it was just strictly score. But as I took a closer look at it, uh, there are a few songs on there, but even he's a member of while he also composes the scores for all his music, um, just composes all the scores for his movies. Sorry. Um, he does, um, he, for some of the proper songs on here, he's in those bands as well. So it's still very much connected to him. So I went ahead and, uh, wanted to highlight, uh, Henry full. This is, I think, I want to say it's like a sixth, um, fifth or sixth feature length, but, uh, thinking back on 97 and how this, this somehow felt different when, um, 
this was coming through Sundance. Like he was going to go next level. He was going to have that, you know, that, I hate go to Tarantino here, but it's the first name that comes to mind. He's going to have right. that breakout uh, that was overdue. And he'd already done pretty well at Sundance even before this uh, particular movie. But, um, you know, it appealed to his crowd and he went overseas and continued to make movies. And um, this, for a lot of people, would probably be uh, the one, if, if, I, if people were being introduced to him without really kind of introducing him as a director, like just say, here's a movie that just happens to be directed by him. Um, this would probably be the one that Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people would introduce him to. And then finally, um, um, for circumstances that I still don't think I fully understand, um, and I think it's by his personal design, um, this is uh, an artist who hasn't been as prolific as I would have liked, but when I think of film, modern film scores, um, he's one of my favorites. Um, and that is uh, John Bryan. And a lot of his stuff has come out on vinyl, has come out even through uh, previous record store days, but I wanted to highlight I Heart Huckabee's. Um, this Good one movie. does have um, uh, some great songs on it, but uh, it's anchored by a score that, um, as I was uh, revisiting it today, um, made me think back of, you know, it's the soundtrack of like old department stores. And like we had a <laughs> um, uh, pizza place um, in the next town over back in the early 80s that had like a um, a piano, like a, a, a Wurlitzer type piano, but the way it was, it was built into the building. So it's like the, all the extra um, parts to it were in these other rooms. Um, and, you know, person would just go and sit there and control it from this uh, main, uh, main station. So, um, yeah, it, it, it has a weird retro quality to it. And um, actually, I was trying to remember, I think there's a special feature on... Maybe it's in the Eternal Sunshine um, uh, disc. It's with John John Bryan, and um, it's him going to this house where basically the instrument that he's playing has been built into the house, um, and it very much recalled kind of that same thing that I'm talking about this uh, pizza place that we had, we had here back in, I think it stayed here through most of the eighties uh, definitely added a unique atmosphere to, uh, to that place uh, when it was here. Nice. Uh, God, those are some decent picks for sure. Um, some of mine, I, I really tried to only choose one from uh, very from all the composers that I was going for. I love that uh, Sidner called out. I feel a lot of John Williams coming on. I don't know about you. I don't have any John Williams on my list. <laughs> no, the closest I would have, and only because this was one that my dad had when I was growing up, would have been Close Encounters. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so some of my uh, honorable mentions here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, easily the most recent one on here. Um, the only time in, I think, that I ever remember leaving a theater and immediately going, God, I hope that the score is already on Apple Music, got in my car after watching The Batman last year, came out from a thunderstorm, of, uh, in a thunderstorm from the theater, put it on and drove home in a thunderstorm listening to this incredible score, uh, this is uh, Michael Giacchino, and it's this score is special. Like I, I really enjoyed the Batman. I think it's great, but uh, it's it's somehow lesser than its score. Uh, the score for this is very driving. It is something that the score itself has stuck with me more than the film has. It is a really, really unique uh, sort of ebb and flow as you go through the entire. Um, 
thing in order specifically and obviously in any good film should do that but in a, many scores you don't get that because it's played in specific scenes but it, when you just go through and listen to this whole score front to back you get that give and take that sort of ebb and flow that comes naturally and makes you feel balanced as you're watching and listening to the entire thing it's an incredible incredible score uh Obviously, I'm a huge John Carpenter fan, and I, I knew that I was going to have one in my main list, but the Carpenter that I chose for my list isn't all Carpenter. So I figured uh, I better have an honorable, honorable mention that's all Carpenter, and obviously I'm going to go with Halloween. Like Everything that he did for this is stupendous. It is one of the most atmospheric soundtrack, soundtrack scores, whatever, ever, and it is done in such a way that is so simple yet so foreboding and it's so interesting listening back to his uh feeling on how everybody hated halloween when he was shopping it around without the music attached to it but the moment he put that score on everybody went oh shit like this is amazing that that gives you the power behind some of the music for these uh and then the last honorable mention that i want to show shout out is one that does not get enough love. And the only reason it's an honorable mention for me is because scores are all about feeling. And this one, I can't listen to all that often because it is so effective at making me feel tense and amped up. Like this is the sort of, I'm going to the gym and trying to break a PR. I'm going to put this score on. <laughs> one Otrix point never doing the score for good time. Uh, that came out from the Safety Brothers. This is easily, easily one of the best modern scores in the last 10 years. I, I think it is a remarkable choice that he made throughout the entire thing. There's a couple soundtrack songs on there, but the score itself is driving. It's electronic when it needs to be. It's moody. It is accelerating in such a way that it's it's got that uncut gems feeling because it's still the Safety Brothers where you're like, Okay, it's about to go down. This is getting crazy. And it's, it is so, so it just emotional when you're listening to it. It is so well done. Uh, it is not uh, the best from the last 10 years, but it is one of them. I will save my best from the last 10 years because it's in my list. What's your number five for your main list, my friend? Okay. All right, let's see here. Make sure I got these. And um, one of the things that I wanted, I, just in case it wasn't made clear when uh, uh, we were doing this, I was focusing on things that I could pull out a vinyl record to go ahead, whether it's just to show off a cool cover or in the case yeah. of a couple of these, I'm pretty sure I'm going to want to go ahead and show off some of the vinyl it itself. But um, this one I wanted to go ahead and pick um and um it's a film i've only seen a handful of times and it's you know 20 some years it's uh been out and i know in recent years when i've uh shared i don't know if enthusiasm is really the right word for it but i guess appreciation for the film itself um it's kind of ruffled some feathers and it's i totally 100% understand uh, the sentiment that it, excuse me, that it is a, uh, for a lot of people, it is a one and done type of movie. If it's a movie that uh, someone shows you on date night, it's pretty much a relationship ender, unless you have a tremendous con conversation afterwards or an intervention uh, of some sort. Uh, and that would be um, from uh, Darren Aronofsky's uh, Requiem for a Dream. Okay. So, um, one of the things that honestly, and re revisiting it today, um, it's the this duo of forces that is set up here. We have Clint Mansell, uh, who had previously worked with Aronofsky. Aronofsky on the their, on the previous film Pi, um, he brings in a very industrial um, techno uh, side to the score, 
and um, very, uh, I like to think of it as a, a kind of a hip hop element to the score as well. Uh, and really brings the um, grit and the sleaze and just the decay that um, these characters are um, working themselves through as the story progresses from season to season. Uh, but then you have the Cronus Quartet, which with their s- strings introduces hel- introduces through the music, I think the horror element that is uh, a big part of that movie. Um, is, and it's that back and forth between the two um, that makes the... Um, that makes the uh, movie appealing for me and makes it as disturbing as some of the imagery that is in the film and some of the things that go on uh, within the story. Um, it, it's the sugar that makes the uh, medicine go down uh, so much easier. There's a lot of medicine in that film. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that is uh, unique with this one, so even if you have uh, just the CD, which you know, I definitely feel like um, if you can't get the vinyl, you know, the CD is great. But one thing that they do introduce to this as an exclusive is the fourth side, which is basically um, a remix of some of the, the score earlier in the uh um i don't know if that's what uh sibner is uh talking about it's looks like it's just two tracks here and there was it took me forever i literally just got it within the last probably six months but there was a um they're known for they were known for techno music back in the 90s 2000s but it was a um remix collection um, CD collection that I finally got a hold of wasn't quite uh, the discovery that I was hoping it was going to be. I, I think the the source music um, is where the uh, the best elements of this can be found. Um, but it was I, I had searched for that particular CD for so long, just finally finding it and finding it for as cheap as I did. It felt like a win uh, in terms of collecting, anyways. That is a great choice. Uh, I, when, as soon as you started saying all that, I honestly expected the fountain to come up. I really enjoy the score for the fountain. Yeah, that would be uh, another one that I. That one I don't think actually has a vinyl as of yet, and uh, definitely uh, would be uh, worthy of one. Um, kind of wondering because um, I know back in the. Uh, uh, time it was um, first released quite the polarizing uh, title in uh, his filmography so still is um, yeah I, I would be curious to see if um, he would be willing to go be- go there and revisit I know there's a uh, I may it may even have it where uh, he recorded a commentary and for some reason Warner Brothers was like no we're not going to put this on here so at some point he just made it available for uh, people to listen to if they wanted to Nice. Uh, my uh, Sibner says there is a vinyl. Oh, excellent. My, <laughs> but it's three hundred dollars on eBay. <laughs> That's the downside. Uh, my number five is probably going to surprise surprise some people because uh, I'm going to say right now, I personally I think it's the best horror soundtrack of all. Not soundtrack. I keep saying that horror score of all time. Um, I. Uh, obviously I love a lot of cult films, love a lot of horror and the score in a lot of them is great, but a lot of times it's a handful of notes played in a few different ways. That is, uh, a little atmospheric and foreboding when somebody's walking into a room and it's a little scary, but it's not something that really sticks with you. It makes you sink in the moment that you hear it when you're watching the film and that's it. Uh, the one I'm going to go with, though, is, I think, the most intricately made score for any horror film. I'm going to have to go with Philip Glass's Candyman. Um, 
this is one of the most beautiful themes, first of all. Uh, the the intentional drawing out of the Candyman theme, it is just stupendous. Um, the way that they reused it in the Nia DaCosta version, incredible, really well done. Uh, but the original, like the entire score is a beautiful mix of genres that really floats along the same theme and draws you in into just the most compelling and easy listening that you can go through with something like this. And that's, like I said, scores for me are about a feeling. And I can put on, I can put on the Candyman score and feel hope and also fear. And I can feel happiness and also dread. And I can feel comfort and also just the worst tension. And because of that, it is such an iconic score to put on just when you're trying to have a moment. And I adore every single track in this score. It is so worth it uh, to spend some time with. I it, This may be the one that I listen to probably the second most on my entire list, but the other ones have affected me a little differently. So, yeah, this one, this one is big for me. I had a feeling this discussion was going to make be, be be a little expensive for me tonight, but I'm glad <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear you speak on that. Um, yeah, that that's that's awesome, and yeah, I, and I will explain just how much more awesome that is uh, in just a few minutes. Awesome, number four for you. Okay, let's see. Do, do, do. Mm -hmm. I wish I had props for all of mine. I'm sorry, <laughs> folks. Um, so um, I know that um, giving filmmakers a second shot at something uh, can be frowned upon. Uh, whether we're talking about the special editions of Star Wars or if we want to get artsy, the the recent Wong Kong Y box set, but um, this is also actually let me see here. Yeah, this is my uh, my lone uh, horror score. Um, not suggesting it's my all time favorite. Um, I I can't go that I, while I do love this a lot. I can't go go that far with it um however um it is if for no other reason the last two times i got to um i've gotten to see this movie three times on the big screen um but it's the last two times that makes me want to um highlight this particular um score and this particular version and that is joe laduca's uh, reworking of the Evil Dead score. Okay. Um, if, and I, I know everybody in here probably has 27 different versions of the Evil Dead movies. I get it. I've got my own, I got my own stack of them. Um, and some of them I'll, you know, I have a VHS. I, it, it will probably go with me, uh, when, it, when it's all said and done. Um, that said, um, what um, he was able to do here with this score um, rem uh, reminds us of a very um, simple thing when it comes to low-budget films, and that is a great score can go a long, long way to brushing away uh, shortcomings that would be otherwise more apparent. And while the original score was good, seeing this and they still play it whenever you hear grindhouse releasing advertised the screening of evil dead it is with this score and not the original um 82 score uh that he did um it's not something so radical that you know he's he, he doesn't uh make it change the genre or anything like that he just you know from the years of doing orchestrations and scores he, he just takes all that in and bumps it up and i can still remember i drove i think it was like 
two, two and a half hours to Daytona Beach to see it the first time. And I played this on the way back and got lost for a few minutes. And it made the score even, it just dug in a little bit more on me for that ride back home. So, um, yeah, I can't recommend this one enough. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like out of all the ones I'm going to mention, this is probably the hardest one to get a hold of at this point. And I really wish that would change, whether it's a, another vinyl release, somehow sort something out to where this can be made available so you don't have to uh, necessarily go see it at the theater, although I recommend it. Just something. Uh, I would, um, you, you know, be remiss if we didn't mention. Uh, and so, before I say my number four, I'm going to go into this real quick. Uh, all of the companies that we support nowadays. So, um, obviously, you've got the big ones. You know, Terravision has been on here before. Mondo has done a lot with vinyl over the last handful of years, and their vinyl vinyl department is no more. Um, the Death Waltz Records does a lot nowadays. Uh, oh, jeez, that is a great color palette. Um, the the big one for a lot of people that are into horror vinyl lately is Waxwork Records. Um, I did want to highlight them for a second because tomorrow at I believe eleven a.m. Eastern, they're releasing the vinyl for Evil Dead Rise. So if you want to stay on top of some of these things. This movie is getting pretty rave reviews across the board, and uh, you may love it and want that in your collection. So you may keep an eye out that eye out for that tomorrow. Any other major vinyl companies that you want to shout out? Uh, not necessarily for scores. I'll definitely want to mention if we have time here at the end. I'll go ahead to kind of tie into the day itself. I wanted to go ahead and. Uh, show off one extra title and uh, show some appreciation for a favorite label of mine. Uh, I'm posting that link that Simner just emailed to me. This is for the cover of the Fountain Vinyl. It's, I gotta admit, it's pretty dang sweet. It's really well made. I, I can see it being very expensive, though. <laughs> uh yeah, uh, lots of good companies putting out vinyl nowadays. Um, one that I somehow just forgot, but uh, La La Land Records, super important. Um, and then the other one that we kind of shit on for the Blu-ray <laughs> side, Enjoy the Ride Records actually does a lot in vinyl, and they are fairly inexpensive, and they have new drops every Friday. So um, I, I would keep an eye out on some of those if you're looking out for vinyl releases. Okay, number four. Number four is a big one. Um, okay, all of mine are big ones. I, I should stop saying that. Uh, number four is probably the biggest composer on my list, though. Um, and that is the uh, the intimidating Ennio Morricone. And I had to put one. And this was, this was damn near impossible to label which one I was going to throw on here. And... It's hard when you have so many iconic scores that there is a chance that you have 30 people in a room and all 30 have different opinions on which one is the best. And uh, one that is from a film that's been out of print, uh, as I think everywhere, but in the U.S. especially, for years. I'm going to have to go with Once Upon a Time in America. The score for this movie is something that does not get enough love. Uh, I, like I said earlier, I mentioned jazz. Jazz is hugely important to me. And one of the things that the score has a, a few flares of is that whole New Orleans feel, the dirge, the, uh, the, the feeling of walking down the road and seeing a band playing on the corner. And you just have to stop and listen because they're so compelling. The music in this is, it, it's, powerful and that's one thing that morricone always had and why he got paid so well to do this for so many gigantic films uh once upon a time in america for anybody that has never seen it is so well made and one of the things that really lights it up for me is this score and it's a long film and this is one thing that really holds it together because without this score i don't think it would have been quite as impactful 
I love this and I love this movie. Uh, it, it is it, it is a travesty that we don't have a good high def release of this movie out and available right now. I don't understand it and I hope we get a 4K soon. That's all I got for you. I'm not going to go ahead and shuffle through the papers to um, figure out which one, but since you brought uh, Morricone up, uh, one of the scores that is going to be available this weekend, again, can't remember the name, which movie, but uh, one's going to be out for Record Store Day. And he's a pretty pretty good mainstay, good for one or two of those to pop up uh, each year, whether it's in this main Record Store Day or um, um, Black Friday. Yeah, he uh, he's done all right over his career, I guess. Yeah, has a few a, a few few classics in there. <laughs> all right, number three, my friend. All right, so when I was putting when we were putting our list together, I felt pretty confident that we were going to um, not have. The same. I don't think any either of us was going to have uh, the same movie score. I kind of said to myself, though, I don't think we're. I think we're going to have ten different composers here. I was wrong. <laughs> because and this was. I want to say um, um, from two. Uh, record store days ago, maybe longer at this point in the last few years being a blur and everything. Um, so this was one I got from record store day. Um, I'm having the opportunity to listen to it now away from the movie. I'm really impressed at how well it stands on its own because if you love this movie, it's almost impossible to ignore the music. I mean, cause it's, so front and center um, in it. Um, and this, um, I can remember see, seeing the VH bo- VHS box of it. Um, didn't see it until I was in college, but remember, I think it was, um, I actually, before I, before tonight, had it in my head that it was more than just Francis Ford Coppola that was involved with it as an um, executive producer. Um, I thought Lucas was somehow involved um, as well, but I think I, I, everything I read up on, I was mistaken. Um, when we did, when we showed this at um, in, at my college, they went out of their way to bring in extra like PA speakers so that we could get the full effect of the score. And I saw it then, and eventually. Um, saw it some years later and then got the criterion box and have vowed at some point to get beyond this first movie, but uh, I have it. And that is Koyana Scotsy from Philip Bless. Wow. I got to see this again over at the, um, uh, (laughs) Here we go. Uh, over at the uh, Tampa Theater um, a few years back, and um, it just floored me all over again. And that was before they put out this um, this particular. Um, actually, and the funny thing about it was you you were talking before about how um, Record Store Day ends up bringing these different titles out on vinyl for the first time. While this may have been out on vinyl uh, previously, uh, it was not the complete score. So uh, I think several of the songs were uh, shortened or or just simply not there. Uh, The Grid um, is the whole third side of this record. Um, And um, it's just one of those... there's something that's so simple and beautiful about the composition that's uh, curious to see here. 
Sibner says, I've now twice found signed Philip Glass CDs of the hours while shopping secondhand, both of them for a dollar. Wow. Um, maybe that was some promotion that went wrong. <laughs> Only signed 412,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just seems an odd thing for that. There has to be a story behind that. Um, but there is uh, just something so simple about the way he composes and you take that song the, that composition the grid it's 20 minutes but if you isolate the part that is unique it's just like this short seg short segments of it they're just repeated over and over and over and over again which works great for the film and just um it's there's just something about it and it's something that i I think I need to explore further in terms of uh, in, in terms of that particular type of classical music because it there, there's something to it that I haven't quite gotten my uh, hands around and uh, again while I'm impressed how well it um, works as just a listening experience um, it, it's hard to separate from that movie itself. It's uh, and the fact that Awaken got that announcement earlier today, I, and I was literally listening to the score when that announcement came. And I was like, <laughs> if you believe in like weird signs, like sure, okay, I need to go get this Fine. now. Finally, <laughs> fine. You twisted my arm. Perfect. Uh, I, I it seems like in the chat, Sibner's the only one that cares about scores, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we've got an interesting list so far i'm really happy with these kind of shocked that we've both picked philip glass <laughs> but i'm glad uh this next one is probably only going to be me because this is a very mainstream pick and this is uh very like probably a, a quite a bit off brand for me but uh i i just gotta kind of hand it to the two of them this is this is one of the best uh scores of the last 20 years i i still think it's not the best because my number two i think is the best but uh this one um i'm gonna have to go with trent reznor and atticus ross for the social network um again it's very mainstream and that that usually isn't the way i lean but this entire score is just perfect and when you think about it for a movie about the founding of facebook if it had a boring score this movie would have been fucked the score for this movie is incredible. And when we're watching this movie and it has some of the, the most uh, eloquently written, fully, fully David Fincher dialogue, uh, it, it goes into these depths that it needs these striking musical moments. And the way that they deliver on this score, it just over and over again, it constantly comes through. Uh, I immediately, immediately bought this one, I think on CD and vinyl, back when it first came out. And this is one of those CDs that lived in my car because it is incredible driving music. Uh, I am, I'm not usually one to even drive that much anymore, but uh, this is one that it is, it's great for reading. It is great for putting on and doing stuff around the house. It is great for uh those moments when you just you need a break from life because again you can be all in your feelings uh i completely completely love this um Sibner's throwing out the score for mink i'm a terrible fincher fan because i've still not seen mink i i'm i don't know why i'm making myself wait but uh i i'm eager to see what he's got coming out this fall um i i love this score i don't love everything else from trent reznor and atticus uh ross I, I liked Nine Inch Nails plenty back in the day, but I, I think that Reznor is really on top of his game with the stuff that he's done for scores. Yeah, one that if it if we were just... With the rules that I set in on this, there was no way it was ever going to make it, but as I was going through, through my um, CDs, I saw the one, um, the one for uh, Natural Born Killers... Ah, yeah, that's a good one. And just, well, now to think about 
that and where he has progressed since yeah. then, I don't think anybody had it on their on their card that that was going to happen. Yep. And it's all the more impressive, I think. Completely agree. All right, my friend. We're on top two territory. All right. So uh, this one. Um, so a uh, different kind of documentary um, that we're uh, going to for this one. Uh, one about um, a, a movie about a movie or more accurately a movie that never was. And this soundtrack should have, I mean, shouldn't be what it is because, I mean, documentaries, I mean, obviously by the last example by itself. Let's see. Travis says he still hasn't seen Once Upon a Time in America. You got to see it, my friend. Um, so, um, <laughs> So obviously, a documentary having a tre tremendous score has its place. Uh, you know, obviously, this last one speaks to that. But um, the fact that this serves not only as a doc a, a score to a documentary, but also a score. It, it could have been the even though it wasn't the artists who were supposed to originally score this film. Um, it could have been. Um, the score for this uh, for this movie, and that's Horowski's Doom. <laughs> I don't know. I know that this is still more. This is widely available as um, as a vinyl record. Um, I don't know if all the editions include this poster. And they have this is this is one that went up pretty much the day I got it and hasn't come down since uh there's just something about this that just that's nice it, it, it it's futuristic in a way that you don't i i i don't feel like i see this enough in uh in, in uh, visions of the future for better or for worse um this is one of the ones that i wanted to attempt to show off um they have different very different variations when they do the uh, releases on this one. And I don't know how well that's showing up, but that's it's decent. Yeah. That's one. And then let me go ahead and. Wow. So all of them kind of a different sort of splatter uh, effect there. And um, yeah, it's having. Uh, Hodorowsky's uh, voice bookend the score um, gives it maybe a little bit of a a um, little bit of a biographical element to it that maybe brings it back to working as as a, a score for the documentary. Yeah. But yeah, it, the fact that um, they had the the sense to go ahead and score it to the storyboards that had been collect had that had been put together and been sitting for all those years um definitely uh helped enhance that documentary and the score on itself um it, it's one that you can just get lost in um in a, in a way of like a lot of good prog rock uh, uh music uh from the period that that film would have been uh made in all right uh so my number two uh my number two is a, a fairly recent discovery for me i think i saw the film for the first time oh gosh uh i'm gonna say about a year and a half ago maybe a little more and this this score immediately captured me um like i've alluded to i think that this is the best score of the last 10 years by a long shot um i think uh Obviously, this is for my taste. A lot of people are going to think that this is terrible, but uh, I I am huge on jazz when it's well done and done in a way that is uh, whimsical, I guess, and not in not in like a, a pretentious old timey jazzy whimsical way, but in more of like an adventurous whimsical, and 
it it helped elevate the themes in this movie so so much that i i fell in love with this movie and obviously nowadays we uh we've got a little bit of a of an issue because the the film itself is great but as somebody in it that's now a little problematic as of the last couple months um i am stoked to try to give a little more attention to uh, a composer that has been doing some stuff for a24 which I know that's full of pretension and all that stuff, but uh, his name is Emil Masri. And uh, one of uh, his other scores, actually, um, I also really love, and that is for the movie Minari. Uh, I think he did great for Minari, but I think his his breakout film for composing is still his best film for composing, in my opinion, and that is The Last Black Man in San Francisco. So the film itself is very good. Uh I said it's got somebody problematic. Jonathan Majors is in it. He beat up multiple people. He's a piece of shit. I get it. Um, either way, the story is just... It, it's... It, it is a film all about race and yet not about race at all. And it's not one of those ones that is exploiting on like white guilt or anything like that. So it's... It's nice to see a film like this uh, be successful on the acting front, on the plot front, on the score front, and on top of all that, have incredible, incredible performances from literally everybody in the movie. Um, the score for this movie is bouncy. It is profound. It is uh, incredibly engaging. It is playful when it needs to be. It is this unique blend of like San Francisco and New Orleans a little bit. And it's just this wonderful atmosphere that is the best possible soundtrack to your life, no matter what you're doing. It has been like the magic I've needed. Uh, I, I've listened to this score far too many times uh, in the last year and a half. It is just a, a gift in my life that I will continue to go back to because it is incredible and emil masri i don't know how he does it but some of the stuff that he's done like singular tracks on a couple of his other scores are brilliant but nothing as an entire package has come even remotely close to the last black man in san francisco this movie is uh, amazing but the score itself even if you're not interested in seeing a movie like this put on the score go for a walk go for a drive clean the kitchen no matter what you're doing this is going to make you have a good time and make you think and feel and be engaged with music in an entirely new way. I, I love this score. I feel like my number one is going to be a real downer then. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too, a little bit. Um, this one... Um, I can't... It, there, I, the fact that it's done by an artist who's probably known more for his pop music um, makes it perhaps easy to discount as a proper score. But um, yeah, I said it, it's one that I, when I was putting this together, this hit number one, number one almost instantly and if we were doing like a let, let me go ahead and pull all my film scores in this one would um even without the constraints here tonight uh would still rank pretty high it was one that i bought on cassette even before i saw the movie um <laughs> the movie ended up being a huge controversy probably never would have played here locally uh, in the first place, but um, the fact that it was out there um, and the firestorm of controversy, I still have uh, the uh, <laughs> I still have the uh, newspaper articles going back from when uh, um, the director was having to defend the film and um, just the whole so much so they went when it came time to actually release the, let me go ahead and I want to sneak. Yeah. 
if you look at it, there's no direct reference to the actual title of the movie. They wanted the score to go ahead and stand on its own. But um, when I finally did see the movie, um, it's one that I'm beyond overdue for a rewatch. Uh, it actually made me reconsider um, uh, reconsider um, my spirituality at, at, at that point in my life. And uh, my parents were very cool about how they approached religion. They didn't force it on me like I know a lot of, uh, of parents of my generation did. Um, and this movie initially pushed me uh, towards it. And what happened without going into a, a much more extended story of it, um, it didn't go well. Uh, it was very, it was just a very quick, brief um, hit and run uh, experience with it. And it's something I'll, uh, it soured me on organized religion in pretty much any and all forms in one fell swoop. Um, but um, looking at it in the scope of, uh, of the director's career since, um, clearly he was looking to explore um, different sides, uh, different religions around the world. Uh, and this, if, yeah, this was the first of two, maybe three films that he did to explore it. Uh, this would be Peter Gabriel's Passion, otherwise... Martin Scorsese's uh, Last Temptation of Christ. Um, I, again, bought it on cassette, got it on CD back uh, back in the day. Um, I used to work, when I worked at a movie theater, worked Sunday mornings. This would be one that would almost, I don't know if I was, it was my way of trying to be resp respectful of what was going on outside the office doors when I was there, or it was my kind of polite little finger to the whole thing or not. But um, yeah, that was, it, that kept this score in my life and um, listening um, this one, um, I keep in pretty frequent rotation, but a lot of what I way I listen to a lot of music at this point is I'll throw a bunch of albums together and just hit shuffle and go. But today I went and revisited this from front to back. And um, even if you've never seen the movie, it just has such a epic scope to it. Um, and it fuses Peter Gabriel's um progressive rock sensibilities with his fascination with world music. Um, Hassan Ramsey, Ramsey uh, Yusuf Farad Ali Khan, Yusu Endor, they all make appearances on this record. Um, and what uh, became, um, what was his exploration of world music um, got me interested in to um, uh, music from other cultures, um, a something I tried to wedge into this, but absolutely couldn't, uh, was Brazilian music, uh, uh, bossa nova music with the um, soundtrack score of uh, Next Stop Wonderland and um, Happy Together and uh, Black Orpheus, just thinking of a few examples of uh, scores that incorporate Brazilian music. Um, but yeah, this uh, this record was a real eye opening um, experience, and considering that it followed up one uh, well, the biggest um, uh, record in Peter Gabriel's career, um, and still at this point, um, he really took a chance here. This was not something that um, um, commercially made sense for him to do, but this ended up being his follow-up to, uh, you know, to the record that introduced us all to, to Sledgehammer. Um, and that record was um, uh, huge to me in ways that uh, I, I won't go into, uh, go into tonight, but uh, this one just, you know, piled right on top of it. And uh, it's as, you know, the record would, you know, 
double LP. It's it's just epic. Um, and uh, while you go ahead and inter- go into your number one, I'll go ahead and I wanted to inter- pull one bit of uh, this out as well. But sure, I'll let you go ahead and get started on that. So I'll stop talking. Well, like I said, my number one is probably going to be a bit of a letdown after a couple of the ones that I can just gush over. Um, this next one is probably uh, one of the most iconic, other than that Candyman score. Uh, this this one, like I said beforehand, I I had to do something from John Carpenter, and this one is one of his collaborations. Uh, this is the only Carpenter score that I will be... Uh, getting ready for work and suddenly find myself humming and I haven't heard the score in three months and I don't know why. Uh, I feel like it is it is the score with the theme that buries itself in your head more than any of the other Carpenter scores, even more than Halloween. And I'm going to have to go with the absolute classic, Assault on Precinct 13. Uh, he worked on this one with Alan Howarth and it is this perfect synth driven uh, like it's it's a pure western soundtrack at heart just like the film itself is and it's done in such this like they're attacking at night sort of score and obviously there's this this movie is pretty damn salacious in a a couple scenes i mean a, a little girl getting shot in the first three minutes is not something that you expect from a movie like this and the score itself it fits every single scene perfectly. Uh, it, it fits the characters. It fits the tone. It fits the the loneliness of being in this building at night when you're vulnerable. It is the, the siege film that you are stuck in, and the score itself gets stuck in you. Because, man, I, I again, I will find myself singing this, and I haven't seen the movie or heard the score in months and i'm like what the hell is assault on precinct 13 in my head for but i love it like this thing has has been with me for so so long i i think the very first time i saw this it it was the only thing from the film that stuck with me and i don't know why the first time i saw this uh it was on some crappy crt tv like most people and it just didn't work for me but then a handful of years ago i got to see this on the big screen I, I went to this film uh, expecting to not love it and left that night going, that may have been the best of the three Carpenter films that I saw on the big screen that night and just fell in love with this newfound respect for Assault that I didn't even know existed. And now I'm desperate that uh, hopefully we get that 4K restoration on disc that Def Crocodile did because I... I need to have the score stuck in my head for all time, I guess. At that one, I know that score was vinyl CD pretty widely available there for Ooh, a minute, yeah. but I don't know if it still is. Yeah, that thing was everywhere. Yeah. And one of the things that threw me off as we were as I was wrapping up my discussion, I had forgotten because the way they put this record together, it wasn't just a double LP, it was triple and the fifth oh. the, they etched the sixth side here nice get, yeah yeah so crazy Sibner says no one clipped that sound bite what did I say accidentally <laughs> I missed it <laughs> uh man these two lists uh I'm gonna run through mine again and uh Terry can run through his again I just want everybody to hear these just in case you were trying to catch up or Stan came in the late just so Stan can hear the whole list we were going over five of our favorite iconic scores my number five was Candyman from Philip Glass my number four was Once Upon a Time in America from of course Ennio Morricone Oh, my newfound love of assault. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, my number three was The Social Network with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Uh, my number two, which may actually be my number one if the other one wasn't such an earworm for me, uh, The Last Black Man in San Francisco from Emil Masri. And my number one, Assault on Precinct 13 with Alan Howarth and John Carpenter. Uh, again, if you are somebody that has not ever paid super close attention to scores or given the time and attention to some of these composers 
that uh, maybe you could. This is one area to cha challenge yourself in. It is, uh, it, it is somehow like extremely rewarding to discover some of these and make them an important part of your uh, film discovery, of your film appreciation. And I will always advocate for giving extra love and attention to, to musicians. Terry, you want to share your five again? Yeah, let me go ahead and get them back up here. I don't think I'm going to do do the show and tell, but just so I don't make sure I don't forget here. All right. So can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, my number five was uh, Clint Mansell with uh, featuring the Kronos Quartet, uh, the uh, score for Requiem for a Dream. Um, number four was the reworked edition from Joseph LaDuca, um, doing the uh, original uh, 82 Evil Dead. Um, number three was Philip Glass's Koyana Scotzi. Um, number two was Kurt Stensel uh, doing the score for another documentary, uh, Hodorowsky's Dune. And then finally, number one was Peter Gabriel um, doing the score for Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ, otherwise released as Passion which was apparently the working title of the film when it was in production. And then Mel Gibson stole it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm honestly a little shocked that if, uh, if you would have told us beforehand we were going to have one match, I probably would have picked almost any of mine other than Philip Glass. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird because with Philip Glass, that score was something that, always stayed with me from the first time that I'd seen the movie, but other than some other, uh, because I, we, we had uh, film projectionists there at the college who one or two of them were really into Philip Glass. So I think I heard like Einstein on the beach back, back then, but he wasn't a composer that really s stayed with me other than the one score. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, I mean, he's done, God, there's a few that he's done. Like, uh, hmm, was it something in, in the 2000s that was really good as well? Um, God, I'm going to kick myself for this afterwards. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Let me, uh, I'm pulling up his things now. Definitely not The Illusionist. <laughs> <laughs> Secret Window is actually pretty good. Huh. I can't remember what I'm thinking of. Maybe it was early 2010s. He's he's done a lot of stuff over the years, but the stuff that he was a main composer on, like, he's not done a whole lot of others. Uh, like, The Thin Blue Line, he was great. Hamburger Hill, he was great. Uh, I Mish about Mishima, that of course. Uh, yeah, Mishmo is easily one of the best ones. Uh, yeah, Philip Glass is... Yeah, The Hours is a big one, of course. Um, oh, man. Look at that. Stan says, I uh, got to see Glass yeah. play the score live accompanying a screening of the film at Royce Hall at UCLA. Good Lord. Good gosh, Stan. And I see uh, uh, Sibner making reference to Cundin, which was uh, one of yeah. Scorsese's other explorations of religion so well this was a lot of fun uh i know that this was a, a little bit of a deviation for the channel focusing on music but i hope somebody got something out of this uh again reminder it is record store day this weekend uh i i had uh, i think it was two people today message me before i posted the stream asking if we were going to be doing stoner films so many people disappointed that i'm not talking about stoner films tonight and i get that it's probably not going to be 420 on a Thursday night for multiple years, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, to that end, though, uh, if uh, this will sort of tie into uh, the last mention I wanted to, to make, uh, and that is uh, a label, uh, the Numero Group out of, uh, out of uh, Chicago. Uh, they do a lot of, to now thinking back, on my discovery of that label and then later discovering uh, Vinger syndrome, 
I feel in their, even though they are operating from two different medium, um, they have a very similar sensibility of just wanting to bring out things that maybe didn't get the proper, their proper due in their time. Um, and that's something that uh, Numero does for music. And um, it, while they themselves are highly critical of Record Store Day, as you know, a, a number of select labels out there are, I totally respect that. Um, but I mean, the fact that, you know, we're going to have potentially a lot of Taylor Swift fans discover <laughs> records for a day come Saturday just because of uh, of a release I, I don't I, I don't frown on that it, it, I mean if it's if it's one and done they don't come back great you know they at least got to have an, their experience of it I feel like this is something at its best should be experienced experienced at least once uh, if yeah. you're a music fan um but um if they see something while they're there and it gets them to explore whether it's another type of music or even just another no, another even if it's just another pop artist it gets them to come back to that store next week next month whatever i i feel that's a win for for stores and i 100 and everybody else um but um i wanted to go ahead and try because i um had this and it seemed appropriate with the fact that tonight was 420 so uh i'm going to go ahead and cut the lights out here and we'll go ahead and <laughs> just, uh show show this particular piece of uh, artwork work off and uh we'll awesome. go from there so give me just a moment terry's going all out for the theatrics <laughs> I, I love that we can see the tie-dye only that's very 420 <laughs> Oh dang! Very yeah, nice. How's that? Maybe that back. Show. Maybe oh, back the light up a little bit. I knew I was going to try to do this without the ears, and it was going to become a problem. Back the the light up a little bit when you're shining it on there. Maybe we'll yeah, like that's, that. that's pretty damn bright. Jeez. As far as I know, this is one of the uh, only record covers that I've seen that uses this bright, uh, this black light. And considering it's a collection of old acid rock recordings from the 60s and 70s, couldn't think of a more appropriate combination. This inside could show up a little better, even though on the surface it's a little more... Oh, Jane. Uh, comparison. Bleh. Unfortunately, that doesn't show very well. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid of that. Yeah, I wish it would be something that could show off better in person. Or I mean, get maybe the colors alone more. are incredible. Get get accustomed to um, showing off, you know, showing things off on the camera uh, with time. Love it. Uh, this, uh, like I said, this has been super cool. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of film scores and anybody that is supporting physical media in any way is somebody that I will be happy to support as well. Terry, you do great for music. I'm so glad that you're here. So glad that you're part of our discord, this community. You guys are amazing. Thank you all sincerely. This has been a fun night. Glad, glad to be here and, uh, glad you, uh, enjoyed my company tonight. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of the Discord, it's the week of our monthly watch along. If you are so inclined, this would be the perfect time to join and uh, get to vote before we watch something on Sunday. It looks like it's going to be uh, a pretty interesting choice. And um, the streak continues. I think that every single time uh, I post up one of these polls, I have allowed my wife the ability to vote on my behalf, and she has never picked the winning title. <laughs> <laughs> and uh the one that she picked this time is behind yet again but uh I, i'm stoked that we get to watch uh the what is most likely going to be the winning title at the moment so yeah it's a very uh interesting list if uh anybody who is going to be there sunday uh hasn't voted yet 
by all means, uh, get in there because I, I, this was probably one of the hardest picks that I, um, I, I've had. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody, please, uh, please come back next week, and uh, we'll have a, have you on for a good show. Other than that, have a good night, and uh, Terry. Hopefully, we can do this again. Love to. See you, everybody. Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share it with someone else that may appreciate this.